Hello and welcome to the second lecture of the class Stabilized Finite Element Methods for Fluid Mechanics. In this lecture I'm going to talk about the prototypical equations. In the introduction we looked at uh, the Navier-Stokes equation and we saw that there were different parts of that equation that were particularly challenging uh, for a finite element method to treat. And the first thing that we're going to do is separate this Navier-Stokes equation into these different prototypical equations uh, that each embody one of these challenges. And then we can analyze these challenges and, and try to solve uh, the problems that arise. Now, this is a lecture that I'll separate into five different chunks, uh, four corresponding to uh, four different equations. Uh, and this first chunk, I would actually like to uh, first take a step back and think about what is conceptually different when we're treating fluid mechanics uh, equations. So why are these equations different from solid mechanics equations? because they both arise from continuum mechanics. So what kind of differences uh, do, we, do we really see? So the question that I would like to answer here is uh, what is the fundamental difference between solid and fluid mechanics. And I think that we can look at this, uh, these differences in two different ways. We can look at them physically, so what's going on with the material itself, and then also mathematically, so what's the, the appropriate way of, of writing our systems of equations. So if we take a look at the physics, and of course we know that um, in a solid, the material is structured in a lattice, and after we apply a load, it may deform, but in principle, the lattice structure remains intact. Differently, in a, in a fluid, we, we have loose atoms that are allowed to shear past one another, and there's no original structure that they would return to after we return the load. And what that comes down to in terms of the sets of equations is that we have extreme deformations. So something that you could think of is, um, well, a boundary condition that we would typically use for Navier-Stokes equations is that around any surface, we have a flow of zero. So the, the velocity is zero, the fluid is stands still at that point. So if you think about what that means, uh, suppose that you would take a flight from Hanover Airport to, uh, to Schiphol. Um, now, nowadays that might not be, uh, be possible, but hypothetically, um, then the atoms that would stick to the surface of the airplane, they would stay on the surface of the airplane. That's the boundary condition. And the atoms that are, are just a millimeter away from the surface of the airplane, well, they stay in Hanover, but the atoms on the surface of the airplane, they move to Schiphol. Right? So those are the extreme deformations that we're talking about. In terms of strain, you would have a strain that spans kilometers, you know, hundreds of kilometers. So, this comes into play specifically for the constitutive relation that we might want to use for fluid mechanics. It makes no sense to write constitutive relations that involve strain, because apparently strain is not a mechanism that uh, is, is particularly important here. So we have different constitutive relations due to this difficulty or this, this difference. Where for solid mechanics, we tend to relate the stress with a strain measure. Now, again, due to these extreme deformations, that actually does not make a lot of sense for fluid mechanics. So what we have to do instead for fluids, we tend to relate the stress to a strain rate. So how much additional strain do we get every second? That is, that is something that induces the stress here. So that's the physical part of, uh, of, of the story. Um, then in terms of, of the mathematics, we have a different way of writing these equations. 
both on the same page. And this is something that you may have heard before. Um, we have this Eulerian description and we have a Lagrangian description of continuum mechanics. And one is more appropriate when it comes to fluid mechanics and the other is more appropriate when, when it comes to, uh, to solid mechanics. So to kind of rehearse what these different descriptions are about, let me draw a picture. So we have here an Eulerian description. Yep. Next week we might have a Lagrangian description. And in an Eulerian description we have a certain mesh. Or we have a certain domain. And we're keeping the domain fixed. And the material is going to move through this domain. So if we take a look at any particular cell in this domain, then the material is going to move through this. Now differently in a Lagrangian description, we fix our domain, our perspective on the, on the physics, uh, we fix that and we attach that to the material. So our, our, our physical domain might be a beam. And then we attach our, our mesh uh, to this beam. And as the material is moving, our reference, our, our, our point of view is going to move with that. And from these two pictures, it's already kind of clear what we're going to use for which uh, particular type of mechanics. Um, tentatively, we're inclined to use a Eulerian description uh, for fluid mechanics and a Lagrangian description for solid mechanics. Now, we don't have to do this, though. Uh, we can also describe fluid mechanics from the perspective of a, of a Lagrangian viewpoint. Uh, that would mean that we would have to attach our elements, looking ahead to a finite element method, to a certain um, flow element or a fluid element in the initial condition, and we would have to track that. Now, that's, of course, going to be very, very cumbersome. Uh, and additionally, based on the physics, we have these extreme deformations, so our elements would, would stretch to, the, uh, to extreme values of, of, again, with the example of an aircraft, kilometers. So for a fluid mechanics application, it makes more sense to do an Eulerian, uh, to have an Eulerian dis description. Now I'm saying that, but there's of course uh, different, nothing is set in stone here. There might be applications for which it does make sense to have Lagrangian description for fluid mechanics. Um, suppose that you actually have a, a fluid that is fixed in a, a vessel, uh, and you're moving the vessel around, you're interested in to see the, the wave formation. In a case like that, it might actually make sense to, to use the Lagrangian description for the fluid, uh, to follow the fluid, um, uh, because you know it's not going to strain too much because it's, it's fixed to that, that uh, vessel volume. Now, similarly, uh, or in the same sense, for solid mechanics, we typically use Lagrangian description. We fix our mesh to the solid. But this is also not necessary. We could also describe the same equations in an Eulerian uh, framework. And in some cases, we might be interested to do this uh, for certain um, industrial machining processes, for instance, uh, or, or processes where material is fed, uh, it is deformed in some way, and it's pushed out again. Uh, so I'm thinking of uh, flattening a plate, where it's, it's pushed between two rollers, and you would have a, a constant inflow of a thick plate that would be pushed between two rollers, and you would have a constant outflow. So in, this, in a case like that, it might not make sense to attach your mesh to the solid that then gets deformed and gets pushed uh, through the, the system. But rather, you might want to have a fixed mesh where you also have a, a material flowing through it. Yeah, so even though typically we, we think of the Eulerian description to be the one that, that corresponds to fluid mechanics and the Lagrangian perspective to be the one that corresponds to solid mechanics, uh, this is not uh, necessary and there's definitely exceptions.
Now, to, uh, to, to kind of summarize what I've just said, uh, so this is going to be a fixed non-deforming reference frame through which material moves. And the Lagrangian perspective is a moving reference frame that deforms together um, with the material. So the way that we would end up writing our physical systems of equations is that in this case we would have certain balance laws on control volumes. Whereas here we can more directly use uh, Newton's laws on, on the infinitesimal elements. And the point that I was making earlier is that both solid mechanics and fluid mechanics can be described in either reference frame. So that also means that even if, if you're focusing a lot on solar mechanics in, in your work, you might still come across cases where an Eulerian description is more appropriate. And the combination of these, these, two, these, these two things that we pointed out earlier, the physics and this mathematical description, uh, they are uh, the cause for a lot of trouble in the fine attainment method. Uh, so if you end up having to use uh, an Eulerian description for solar mechanics, and a lot of the things that we'll, we'll discuss in this lecture series are going to be important for you. Okay, so I think this is what I'll, I'll stick with for the first uh, part of this lecture. And then I'll start deriving the, the relevant equations in the subsequent parts. Thank you for your attention.